Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thanksgiving NFL DFS game by game show here on the channel. No Jacob Sanderson. He will be with me on actual Thanksgiving recording for the week 13 slate because he's Canadian and he doesn't even get to eat delicious turkey and pecan pie and all kinds of beige sides. I will be joined by fan favorite John Daigle, and we're going to break down every game on the Thanksgiving slate and provide some shippers. Let's get into it. It's short King Summer, dude. It just feels like no one in fantasy sports ever learns anything. Does he mistime it, or is Brock Bowers just a grown man? Brock what? Bowers is just a grown man. Dare I say, Rich, football might be back. In the words of Lane Johnson, this offense looks constipated. It's short King Summer. All right, Daigle, we are here. This is uh, for, for people... In you and I's line of work, this is like the craziest week of the year because not only do you have to do full slate analysis for the games that are being played on Sunday, there's also a game on Friday. Are the games on Saturday this week? I haven't looked. I really hope there are not. The Chiefs play on Friday against the Raiders, but we also are going to be doing full analysis for this three-game slate, which truly for me, I I actually love. I, I have always enjoyed the Thanksgiving NFL DFS slate. I'm a big Thanksgiving guy. Big Thanksgiving food guy. It's it's sometimes controversial in in these parts, but I I am a big Thanksgiving guy in general. Short slates are my strength. If you look at Roto Tracker, in particular, Thanksgiving and playoff slates, just because there's so much late swapping that's required or not required, but absolutely gives you an edge deal, especially when the entire field is napping or drunk by the time the late game comes around. That yes, I do try to prefer to look for spots in these types of slates where I can go overweight uh, four or five players in an offense trying to soak up every single touchdown on the slate. And then also some late inactives that maybe we can take advantage of. I think there's situations in a lot of these games. It's interesting because every game total is coming down so far, which I guess shouldn't be shocking. There's lots of recency bias that's also going to take place on this slate. So let's get into it. No, that's a, that's a great point. Not only do people not use late swap enough anyway, but they really are not going to use it on Thanksgiving where like no. people are not around their computers, they're drinking, they're eating, they're, they're out, you know, they're doing whatever they are going to do. Uh, so as always, we are going to do, uh, we're going to do position by position. We're going to do game by game. And we are going to begin hottest take of the slate. I've got right here, Daigle. This is going to be a competitive game. We are, we are going to see the Bears. I'm not going to say they're going to win the game. I will say at some point in this game, they will have the lead. They will be at, at some point in this game, the Chicago Bears will have more points on the scoreboard than the Detroit Lions. That might mean it's it's 10 to 3. That might mean it's uh it's 7 to 3, but at some point it's going to happen. I, I feel very good about that. There are tons of great plays in this game. I assume the largest amount of ownership in one game. I don't know. Will this game have more total ownership or Miami Green Bay, you think? I think this game, because the Bears are playing competitive, you said, and I believe everyone will then think this is going to be a high-scoring affair. Uh, there's enough reason to believe that maybe people come off the Dolphins for the weather. We'll get into that in a bit. So I'm going to say this one for sure. Yeah, I think you are. I think you are are definitely correct. So I will say the very interesting thing about the Lions is that conceivably they can all get there. You could have a game where St. Brown is required to win money, mm -hmm. where David Montgomery, Gibbs, Laporta, even maybe even Jamison Williams, probably probably four of those guys, maybe, maybe three, could be in the optimal, while Jared Goff is also not in the optimal, right? Because he is not super live to get the 300 yard bonus. I suppose if, if they really get pushed um, this year, he has the 300 yard passing bonus three times. Uh, he's 6,500. He's not going to add any rushing production. I, for the money you are required to spend, prefer Caleb Williams at 5,300 against this defense to golf because the, the Lions run defense is good and their pass defense is fine. But the thing is, is they absolutely dare you. They're one of the few defenses in the NFL that really dare you to throw on them. They basically organizationally are like, you are not going to run the football on us, which I, I think definitely tilts towards the Caleb side. And even in handling, what was it, 84% of their backfield touches, all but three backfield touches last week for DeAndre Swift. We also know that 
with all five of Roshan Johnson's touchdowns this year coming from one yard out. Swift ceiling is just cat. So not really a player. I'm looking to play on this slate anyhow. Um, it's interesting, this game, because there are certainly paths to it failing. I do like your Caleb Williams side if you go that route, if only because the last couple of weeks under Thomas Brown, we've seen, seen an increase nine and six carries for Caleb, providing that rushing floor that we knew we had coming out of college. I believe he had 27 career rushing touchdowns at USC, yep. so we knew he had it. But one on one hand, it's what the Lions defense is because they honestly haven't lost a step since Aiden Hutchinson got injured. They still haven't allowed multiple touchdown passes to any quarterback at any point all year long. Uh, this is one of my talking points in other DFS shows I do for Anthony Richardson last week, thinking that, okay, they also haven't had too tough of a schedule. Remember, they played C.J. Stroud. Well, that's enough. In twenty, They played 2024 C.J. Stroud, but also right. it, it was without Nico Collins. That's not an NFL offense when Nico Collins is out there. Questionable if it's an NFL offense when Nico Collins is out there as well. They also played Jordan Love whenever it was raining out. Dontavian Wicks had the drop touchdown, and lots of Ugh. players out there were just mucking them up. Jared Goff put gloves on for that game too. So I can still question their schedule. But, I mean, really, the metrics behind the scenes, they haven't lost a beat even. Um, also, the fact that they are second in the league in red zone scoring. Only the Broncos have a better red zone defense this year in terms of allowing touchdowns. So I'm still questioning the ceiling of this Bears offense that Caleb Williams has gotten better. It's not only the rushing floor. He's fifth in completion rate under pressure the past two weeks as well. That's also because the way they're scheming the offense, they're just asking them to get the ball out as quickly as possible. That's also what's happening to DJ Moore. Uh, DJ Moore now has spiked back-to-back -back weeks of top 24 production, but he's averaging a 1.9 depth of target. That's why he's scoring seven more fantasy points per game than expected based on his usage and has 30 more yards after the catch than the next closest receiver the last two weeks because he's just getting close to the line of scrimmage and then being explosive, yes, but also how long can you live on producing like that many yards on a 1.9 A dot? So I'm questioning, honestly, the 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 ceiling of this game overall. It's one that I think could lead Dan Campbell in a divisional matchup to instead instill physicality, and we then get Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery being the successful players here as well. Remember, Chicago last year, they had Matt Eberflus in 2022. They didn't go out and make their giant splashes, in particular at linebacker, until last year's free agency. And then Jared Goff in two games against Matt Eberflus last year, just three touchdowns to five interceptions, less than 240 yards in both of those games. The Bears also play a lot of zone coverage, and as we saw against the Colts, Gus Bradley took it to another level last week. Uh, literally all but one of their defensive snaps for the Colts came in zone coverage, and that's why... They limited the line's explosive plays through the air, and that's also why you then saw Campbell instead just lean on Gibbs and Montgomery, saying, okay, if you're not going to let us beat you over the top, we'll just beat you in the trenches. I feel like this game could become that type of approach. So I'm questioning it, but Caleb Williams is definitely in my pool of quarterbacks on Thursday. I just that is definitely that is definitely what is going to happen. I, I think this is much more of a Gibbs Montgomery game than it is a St. Brown, Jameson Williams, Laporta game. I mean, one, the we're actually not used to saying this, but the Bears defense is quite good. They don't really let you, I mean, they don't really let you beat them anywhere. They're the number two defense by total EPA. They're, they're a little bit weaker in pass defense than run defense, but that kind of stuff also, I, I don't go for that micro analysis too much basically like i think the lions are going to want to establish it here the bears will probably be happy to not let the explosive plays happen you know the 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 triple reverse flea flicker to sam laporta open down the seam like they're not going to want any of that stuff to happen this is the data for the last two weeks with thomas brown calling the plays keenan allen's target share and targets per route run has jumped massively and also roma dunze I think Rome is basically the forgotten player of this slate. I think Keenan is going to get a ton of ownership. And I think, you know, the game log stuff on DJ Moore, like, and people just love DJ Moore also. That mm -hmm. is a big part of it. I am I am one of those people. Now, let me make the, the pro DJ Moore argument, which is that in a three-game slate, 
you will need someone in your lineups who beats their projection on efficiency, right? I mean, that's just that's just the nature of the beast. And and actually, the ETR stuff is not up yet, so I just have the the vanilla Roto Grinders projections loaded up here in the solver. And like you know, they like DJ Moore is projected fine, you know, uh, at twelve point five points or whatever. But I basically think on a three game slate where you are needing to do you are needing some efficiency spikes i think that more and a dunze are the ones that i like here as opposed to keenan because i i would guess keenan is going to end up being probably the most owned of that group and maybe none of them will be particularly chalk what about well what do you what do you think about this just every lineup you got to include one of gibbs or montgomery just every lineup you got to mm-hmm. do one of gibbs or montgomery that right now I'll probably make, I don't know, 10 teams or something like that. I would probably lean towards just a, well, I mean, you got to include a line on every team because they have the highest team total of the slate by a billion, but I, I would probably lean towards one of the running backs almost every time. You can get both if you want in this slate too. You got to give up something at wide receiver, but honestly, we've seen Amon Ross St. Brown, although he did have the touchdown streak. Also, it's been rough outside of two weeks ago for him to be an actual ceiling play to pay off his salary. 161 and two touchdowns against the Jaguars in that 52 to six route. But beyond that, paying 8K, um, you know, he had 112 yards against the Vikings and a touchdown, but he's not really a player you were trying to spend up for just because the target tree is so spread out. I feel like we do this every Thanksgiving. We talk about one of, if not playing both of Gibbs and Montgomery. Montgomery always, and probably will again on Thursday, coming at lower ownership. That's the way I lean right now, especially for the salary discount. He got injured this past game, but then after the game, Dan Campbell even came out and said that he t- Montgomery wanted to come back in and could have, but he told him that we have bigger fish to fry. I think that means in a divisional matchup this week. So I personally like Montgomery for the ownership margin. I'm with you on that, and I'll also tell you that Dan Campbell, I know a lot of things about this world, and one of the things that I know about this world <laughs> is that Dan Campbell is going to get this man a touchdown against yeah. his former team. I mean, I can just if you can not go two. ahead. Yeah, if if not two. Uh, Mo- Montgomery, probably the early lead for uh, for favorite play here. Comet or Laporta, which one do you prefer? It, I If Laporta really is something like, five to 15 percent owned kind of anywhere in that rhythm the fourth fifth most owned tight end of the slate like i know he's he's been bad the targets per route run has been bad like he, he just is not the player he was last year i i think just with this team total i'll, I'll really want to be on him i don't mind laporta tight ends tough because there are a lot of good options uh yeah especially in these those next two games we'll talk about so it's been a condensed target tree since Thomas Brown took over, Odunze leading the team, then Keenan Allen, and then DJ Moore last at 17.7% with that short A dot. Cole Komet coming in afterwards. So I may get away from Komet, but definitely don't hate the idea of running Sam Laporta and skinny stacks. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's honestly just really tough at tight end. My favorite play, I'll tell you my favorite play, we haven't even talked about, is that I questioned Jameson Williams' ceiling because he had not someone who could earn targets at all prior to the suspension. And the, and, the, and the month before the suspension, just a 12.3% target share. But now three games coming out of the bye. And remember, this is a guy who has a dot over 16. Three games, it's been 19, 21, and 19%. That's close to George Pickens almost with that type of death to target. So if we're now saying Jameson Williams can earn targets and keep that dot. Dude, like that's the guy who like the solver doesn't even see his kind of ceiling. So I love Jameson Williams. Yep, I'm I'm with you there. Uh, all right, let's move on to the New York Giants at the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, I'll tell you this. This is the game that no one wants to play. No one is playing Tommy DeVito. No one's playing Cooper Rush. <laughs> even CeeDee Lamb in a slate where there are just not going to be that many guys who project for a ton of points. Like, the Wandale Robinsonification of CD Lamb is not great on a main slate. Like you don't really want to play CD in, in tournaments on a 12 gamer, but on a three gamer, 10 catches for 70 yards, which I believe is his exact stat line from last week. I, I don't remember. That that could very I mean, if, if all these games just kind of suck, that guy he could very easily get in the optimal for that. Cooper Rush, again, he'll be the fifth most owned quarterback of the slate. Tommy DeVito will be the sixth most owned quarterback of the slate. I'm not saying that these guys are 
the best plays, quote unquote. But from like a, a game theory perspective, you're you're basically just betting on all the other games sucking in this slate. And I will uh, I'll, I'll get this out of the way early. My gold star play of the slate, my my flag plant here is going to be one Mister Rico Dowdle at 5,500. 19 rushes for 89 yards last week. That game was close, and in fact, the Cowboys end up winning that game. Now, it went absolutely insane in the fourth quarter. But again, assuming the Cowboys are kind of able to just play all right defense here, play downhill for most of the game, Cooper Rush doesn't have to drop back 44 times, Dowdle might see the most touches of any player on the slate. It'll be it'll be him or Josh Jacobs. So Rico Dowdle, my favorite play of the slate right now. I'll be curious to see where Dowdle comes in because it is a very affordable salary for a running back that just handled 22 of 25 backfield touches against a front seven in the Giants, allowing a league high 5.2 yards per carry. A very clean spot on paper. I do want to step back, though, in a three-game slate and at least keep open the idea that this was an offense that we quite easily ran defenses against prior oh, yeah. to last week and playing the Commanders. Uh, the Giants are still creating a top three pressure rate, too. That's what they do well. And Cooper Rush has averaged just 3.7 yards per attempt under pressure. So if this is going to become like the defensive game of the entire slate, I am very open to playing the Giants at significantly less ownership than the Cowboys. Cowboys are obviously safer. Tommy DeVito comes in last week, takes four sacks again on just over 30 dropbacks. Last year, he had the highest sack rate, just over 17% among all quarterbacks in his full five full starts. But again, uh, it's not, I don't want to just after last week say, okay, I now trust Cooper Rush when that game against the command against the 0.7 yards per attempt under pressure. So that game, 10 to nine with less than three minutes to go, I want to ignore the wackiness of all the special teams offerings afterwards, right. the giant Terry McLaurin touchdown and say that of course the giants can still get there at low ownership. So I'm looking at different ways to play this game. Luke Schoonmaker also will be a very popular option for all the right reasons. Now Jake Ferguson, not expected to play with that concussion. And now we've seen the last three games this year where Jake Ferguson was injured. Uh, Scootmaker finished as the tight end seven, tight end eight, tight end nine. And those three games, including last week, 55 yards and a touchdown was wide open behind the secondary. So yeah, Scootmaker's live. CD Lamb, I'm still questioning his ceiling here. Projected well with in our projections last week. But again, those kind of guys, Malik neighbors included, are always going to project well because they're seeing 30% target shares. But they, in my opinion, are XFL target shares where like, you have to cut them in half because there's the targets are so bad. So I don't know how I'm going to play Malik neighbors just yet, but that's kind of how I'm revolving around this game right now. So I think the the best way to play Malik neighbors is to actually not play him with DeVito. If that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I think if you are playing a lot of teams, if you are playing, I mean, if you're 150 maxing, you need to just from a theory perspective, you, you very likely need to be overweight on, Giants players and honestly, even Cowboys players. I I did the uh, I did the sim show with Nerdy Tenor and Brian Hooper yesterday uh, for the the Battle Royale stuff, and like the clear answer there in those games is the field just doesn't play the field overplays the good plays on a small slate, and they underplay the mediocre plays. And I think we will definitely see that happen with Malik Neighbors. You know, if you just look at the context of wide receiver. Neighbors is projected for the third most raw points. Now he's very close to Keenan. He's very close to Watson. There will be salary reasons why you would not want to play him. But on a three game slate, as you well know, John, like raw points are, are the name of the game. And by the way, after the press conference that Malik Neighbors had last week, where he he comes out and he's like, Oh, why didn't they get the ball in the first half? And he's like, mm -hmm. Oh, you gotta ask, gotta ask Dable that. I I have a very strong feeling this is going to be a very Malik Neighbors intensive game plan i think we'll actually see less of wandale uh maybe a little bit of a secret play is theo johnson assuming that he's able to go theo johnson before the start of last week had played the fourth most tight end snaps of any tight end in football john it just any tight just the fourth most snaps of of any tight end period uh it's a you know obviously tight end it's just kind of always a, a gross position so i think he is is pretty interesting the question i would have for you is do you think that tolbert at 3,800 is attractive. Do you think he's appealing? I mean, he he is actually running more routes, and he, he's on the field like 100% of the time 
Now, Brooks, Turpin, Mingo, Flournoy, and Brebin Span Ford rotated in 11 and 12 personnel. Yeah. But I, I think Tolbert is, is kind of interesting. He's getting there on touchdowns. I'm much more interested in the cheap Packers receivers, but perhaps so, For is, sure. the, so is the field. Uh, so I don't hate it if you want to go overboard at, relative to what the field is doing on this game in particular. Again, I'm looking at the defenses and then, yeah, just sorting out how I'm going to play the wide receivers. We haven't even talked about Tyrone Tracy either, who was shaping up to be an amazing play, out touched Devin Singletary 8-1 to one until he had that fumble in the third quarter. And then from that point forward, five touches, yes, but four were on the very last drive. It came in receptions because he didn't get another carry after that. So I don't know how they're going to deploy their running backs in this game. If they want to win, they have to use Tyrone Tracy, but it could be more of a timeshare because that was his third fumble. It's, and it's definitely – I I, I – I feel very confident. Maybe not Eric Gray. Maybe the Gray snaps kind of go away. Mm -hmm. I feel very confident that Devin Singletary is going to play more than the Tyrone Tracy people want him to. Which, which is still interesting because Tracy can still have the pass catching role, and that means he can get there on a short slate. So I'm just not sure how I'm going to play it just yet. I need to see what Tracy and Dowdle's ownership will come in at before I make decisions here. So Dowdles is going to come up. Dowdle will end up being. There's no way Dowdles. Yeah, just seven percent. That's crazy. He will. No he will be the fifth most owned running back. It will be. It will be uh, a chain first, then probably Jacobs, maybe maybe Gibbs, then Montgomery. So so a chain Gibbs Montgomery Jacobs in in some order will be how it will go, and then Dowdle will be five, and then Tracy will be six, and he might be a distant six. Uh, I mean, you know, part of it depends on how our friends at, uh, at establish the run, you know, it depends on what Leone gives him for, for points, you know, uh, that, that is definitely going to impact it. Let's go ahead and move to this final game. We have the Miami dolphins traveling to play at green Bay does seem like we are going to get some cold weather does seem like, uh, you know, it's, it'll be to a, to in the cold, man. What do we do with Tua in the cold? Obviously on paper, I think this game seems like the best game. We have two. Packers are a playoff team. The Dolphins winning here would actually be huge for them making the AFC playoffs. So kind of a, I mean, I, I think it, it's like a 95% must win game for the Dolphins. Romeo Dobbs is not going to be playing here. I, I, I would imagine he suffered a concussion. He's got 72 hours, or 96 hours in between games. He was listed as DNP concussion protocol on the estimated practice report. That brings our old friend Dontavian Wicks onto the field. I would caution you if you look at the box score, you see some Melton and you see some Malik Heath last week. But by the time Dobbs had got injured, I believe they were up, I believe 20 points when Dobbs got injured. Wicks ran the routes, but then when it was truly out of touch, all of Wicks, Reed, and Watson were on the sideline. And that was when Heath and uh, and Melton were playing. So I do think Wicks becomes a 75% a, a snap share guy now. I'll be curious to see what the field is doing with this group. Yes, because we did get the Josh Jacobs, the foreseeable, I should say, Josh Jacobs game. Jacobs at yes. 9% with no Trent Williams. Get the fuck out of here. Come on, guys. We got to get better than that. Uh, I was so happy that Jay Glazer news came in so late because that was an immediate. Brandon Allen did not matter. I was actually gearing up to play 1% Brandon Allen, but Trent Williams makes all the difference in the world for that offense. He is, think of all the talent they have, he is their most important offensive player. They cratered last year without him. They cratered again this past week. That allowed Josh Jacobs now in two games out of the bye. Well, let's go a game and a half because from the time they came back from their bye to the time they took a 31-10 to 10 lead over the Niners, Jacobs has handled 78% of backfield touches. He's been never down back. But... And well, one, I'm happy he did that because this is not a good spot for him. We're going to see where his ownership comes in at. It's a tight squeeze when you're talking about getting Montgomery and A. Chan and Gibbs in there as well around Jacobs. He's definitely my least favorite among all that group. Miami out of their bye now has been airtight on the ground. Even James Conner, just 53 yards on 20 carries. James Cook at 44 yards, and they held Kyron Williams to 62 rushing yards as well. So not looking to play Jacobs here. Could get there as an every touchback, but when we're talking about those other guys, I prefer them. Uh, so it's interesting for the Dolphins because now since week eight, since they got two a back. I know it's been sporadic. It's not been what everyone's expected for Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle in particular, 
but they are first in EPA per play and first in drop back EPA. Two has now played two games under Mike McDaniel where it's been freezing weather, 32 degrees or lower, and he's completed 53% of his passes for just 6.2 yards per attempt. But this Packers defense is one, again, that I in particular was going to fire up Brandon Allen against because they're bad. They're not good, allowing over five yards for play, including a couple weeks ago when they played the Bears under Thomas Brown, and the Bears also got over five yards for play, which should make you question everything in life. So if we're talking still about the Dolphins' offense at full strength despite the cold, I'm going to hope ownership sinks to a, and this offense as a whole. It's been spread out since he returned in Week 8. It's actually John New Smith who leads the team with a 20% target share. Yep. Ty- Tyreek Hill at 18%. Jalen Wallet at 15.5%. But my approach is still going to be to go overweight, play all five together to try and get unique among the field, maybe lose Jalen Waddle, if only because that was a season high um, target share he had this past game. So if it's just if it's just one game, I can at least convince myself that's a blip on the radar. He could definitely end me, but he'll probably be overweight if only for that one game. Because remember, before last week, no one wanted to touch him in season-long or DFS. So yeah, I'm coming at this from the approach of I really like the Dolphins offense regardless, even ahead of the Lions offense. I want to get overweight there. And for the Packers, if I don't think personally Jacobs is going to be successful, then yes, I want to get back in on this receivers without Romeo Dobbs suffered that concussion. We have 83 plays this year with Dobbs off the field, and it's Jaden Reed who has a 23% target share, Reed who has a 20% target share, and only two games all season. So if we can now guarantee him this opportunity with Dobbs off the field, certainly becoming interesting because he'll play in two wide receiver sets. And then, of course, Christian Watson's box score looks a lot better if he doesn't drop the 60-yard touchdown last week, which is always in his range of outcomes. But he was wide open, and he had it, and it literally just bounced off his hands. And then, of course, it's DFS. I think everyone, I don't think anyone cares anymore. They're just going to play the best cheap play. Dontavian Wicks, we now have two games where either Dobbs or Watson missed this year, and Wicks in those games had a 24% and 28% target share. So I, I probably will... I, I'm going to I'm gonna figure out how to play it. I may come away with seven players in this game, honestly. Uh, I still like Wicks a whole lot, especially if we get condensed ownership on him, everyone trying to avoid him, in particular for Jalen Tolbert. So we'll see, but I think this is still, regardless of the weather, my favorite game of the entire day. So... What's interesting about that is I kind of get the sense that the field is going to drift the other way in this game. Mm -hmm. The field is going to drift the Packers way. They're going to drift Love, Stacks, Love, Jacobs, cheap wide receiver, Tucker Craft. I think people are going to be very wary of particularly Tyreek and Waddle, which is so funny. They'll be wary of Tyreek because he just has not had the explosion game. I mean, he's been okay. Basically, he's been okay, but he hasn't. I mean, he has not had a capital T Tyreek game all year long. Week one was the closest that he got. I believe he got like 21.5 DraftKings points in that game. I don't even think he got the bonus with an ADR touchdown. It was a long time ago. I can't really remember. And then the psychic damage of this season for Jalen Waddle is so intense that even after finally coming off of a spike week, right? We we finally get the spike week for Jalen Waddle. I think we'll probably see more ownership on Janu than Waddle. Now, obviously a chain will be, uh, and I assume a chain will probably be the most owned player of the entire slate. Yeah, uh, I, I would, I would think. And I mean, I've got, I certainly have no argument against that. I thought your point about the dolphins run defense was pretty interesting because they started out the year really banged up and really bad. People were really wanting to attack them. And then they, I mean, they've coalesced into one of the better front sevens in the entire AFC. I agree with you on Wicks. I agree. I mean, honestly, I, I think Watson, Reed, Wicks, like you, you just want to be jamming these guys, I think, because the, the Packers are very run heavy. It's a very Shanahan West Coast offense style where the coaching staff wants to limit Jordan Love's ability to make mistakes, which like, to be clear, he is still making a good bit of mistakes. Like he's a little, he's a little too careless with the ball. He kind of forces it and they want to avoid that. If at all possible, this is a, this is a run first team. So I don't know how many, you know, like triple stacks you want to be making with Jordan love, but I, I really like your angle with the dolphins where they've been a consistent offense since getting to a back, but we have, you know, a lot of these eight, 10 play drives, holding the ball, you know, converting on third and three, running the play clock down to three seconds in a way that they used to not do. And 
you know, that stuff can turn on a dime. Like basically like the Dolphins can just decide they want to be the Dolphins again at, mm -hmm. at any point or, or I mean, in the case of Tyreek, it literally only takes a moment. Safety takes a wrong, Xavier McKinney takes the wrong angle and he's gone. So I, I think I agree with you on that. I think that is of all the approaches we've discussed, I think overweight Dolphins skill position players probably is the best marriage of ceiling projection and ownership that's lower than it should be. The craft ownership is good for sure. And if we're just talking about knowing ball, uh, the Dolphins have blitzed at the 10th highest rate this year. And Jordan Love, that's really where he's regressed across the board. He's been miserable uh, outside the top 25 and completion rate, touchdowns, yards per attempt against the blitz. But the thing is, for those wide receivers, the way Wicks and Watson win, and, and Jane Reed for that matter, like it only takes one. Who, who cares about what's going on paper? We're just looking at ownership and saying these guys win with 50 yard shots. So that's yeah. why I'm willing to like play the Dolphins and then maybe even stack two of those guys. Uh, definitely want to get at least one. Like my favorite play is Jamison Williams and then trying to figure out who the hell is going to score a touchdown between Christian Watson and Dontavian Wicks. All right, well, uh, let's do it. Let's build a team, and then we will get everyone out of here on their on their merry way. John, I will uh, I will let you begin. Uh, a Chan, I, I like right, to well, I like to go chalk when we build lineups together, and then let you go off the board first. All right, well, I will go. I will go off the board first here. I will place. Uh, I, I will put Rico Dowdle in the lineup. My uh, my flag plant play. Rico basically flag plant. Basically, I think that you should play Rico more than you're going to play Josh Jacobs. That that is the is the flag plan. I think Rico at 5,500 at his ownership is is very likely better than Josh Jacobs at 7,000 and his ownership. When I prefer Jacobs teammates for less money, I will go Jameson Williams for all the reasons I mentioned. All right, Jameson Williams. So on this one, well, we can we can keep it going. Let's do let's do Rome. I, I think Rome. Okay again, is just like he's going to be the third most owned Bears wide receiver. But I think you could argue his target profile has actually been the best because it includes the, the few deep throws that Thomas Brown is allowing Caleb Williams to make. Okay, I'll take the first shot and go Tyreek Hill and get us started. I love it. I love it. Uh, I, I think... Yeah, I've man. been leaving I, quarterback open for you because I know you want to play Caleb. So you could you could do either Tua or Caleb with this. Pick. No, I think I think we do. I think it, with with uh, with Tua no Jacobs or with Tyreek no Jacobs in a chain. I think you do. I think you do Tua. I think that's the right way to go. Uh, okay, then if you're going Tua, I'm gonna go Jonu Smith. This is a this is a great way. This is a great way to build. We did not talk about defense at all. Um, not that giant. We talked about Giants and Cowboys. That's about it. Sure. So interestingly, I kind of like the Bears defense because normally when you get these cheap defenses on Thanksgiving, you know, the, the defensive pricing is done based on the Vegas spread. You don't at least get to tell yourself, well, at least they're a good defense, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that playing a, a defense against Goff is, is like profitable, but I mean, the dude, like he can turn the ball over at any point. I just, where does that leave us salary wise? If we go with the Bears, it leaves us with 6.2K. If we go with the Giants, it leaves us 5.7K, which is, there's not really much of a difference there. I will, uh, I will let you choose what we do here at Flex, and then I will, I will decide the defense. Mm. How much do you want to spend on the defense? Well, so for example, if we do, I'm trying to see if we can even fit. If we do Montgomery, okay, so we can't even get we can't even get Montgomery. So this actually leaves us in a weird range where maybe it would be better to come up from Rome, or we can leave some salary. I mean that that's also really yeah. About short that slates, at all. you could always leave. You salary. you you want I, you. I mean, I think you want to be leaving some salary in a yeah. good chunk of your lineups because it means that people are not clicking those. I think I would do like if I was building this for me. <laughs> I think I think I go Waddle and Dolphins. I think I'd play. No, six I, I, I think John. I think that I think that's so good because people don't. They just kind of inherently buck against that. But yeah. this you're telling you're telling yourself a very clear story here, which is okay. No Romeo Dobbs. That's kind of Jordan Love's foxhole guy. Josh Jacobs can't really get it going. The Dolphins score three touchdowns in the first half, and uh, you know we we send people on their way. 
four hundred dollars remaining. To a take my Loa. I love, Beautiful. dude. I just love overstacking and short slates. I love it because that's how you get unique around the good plays. Because everyone tries to break their brain, but the most they ever get to is quads. Like if you can just get beyond that, then that gives you a chance to soak up all the touchdowns. No, that's uh, that's insanely that's insanely accurate. Um, and I can tell you that even overstacking on main slates is good because it puts you in, in unique parts of the game tree. But in a short slate, if you start thinking like, oh, how do I not dupe? How do I avoid what the field wants? Yeah, Waddle in the flex instead of DJ Moore, you just gained uh, like literally infinity points in in uniqueness. Um, all right, and I will uh, I will extend my gold star play. I already mentioned it. It is going to be Rico Dowdle. John, do you want to deliver a gold star play to the people before we get out of here? I can't pick the Dolphin, and I don't want to just leave everyone saying, hey, everyone should onslaught the Dolphin. So I will say Jameson Williams is definitely the first guy like I went to and clicked and then started uh, building placeholders until we get the Sims around him just because I'm, I'm so confident in his target share and his spot in that game. 20% target share Jameson Williams should not be this it's cheap fun. on a Thanksgiving slate. Everyone, I hope that you all have wonderful Thanksgivings. Make sure that you are following Daigle on Twitter, reading his work over at Establish the Run. Comment below your gold star play or tell me your favorite Thanksgiving side. I will accept either. And uh, I'll see you guys all tomorrow. It's, it's short King Summer, dude. It just feels like no one in fantasy sports ever learns anything. Does he mistime it or is Brock Bowers just a grown man? Brock what? Bowers is just a grown man. Dare I say, Rich, football might be back. In the words of Lane Johnson, this offense looks constipated. It's short.